Okay, hello. Thanks, everyone. Um, this is the first full video in the Knowing Your Enemy series, and we're very lucky to get to speak to Tom Mills here, who I hope is going to talk to us a little bit about the state, capital, corporations, the media, and how those things do and do not fit together. Thanks so much for coming today, Tom. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so um, we've already spoken previously about the ways in which this programme is really trying to understand how power works, how how we can understand class power in our time. And I wondered if you could begin by just saying something brief about who is the elite in this country and what do they do? Yeah. I mean, I suppose, basically, like, we could start with, like, the concept of the elite, I suppose, because it's different to class. And I think, like, sometimes on the left, there is, there's been this kind of ill-tempered kind of theoretical debates about whether we should use the term elite, whether we should use the term class and then part of the reason for that is that the term elite gets developed by a group of I suppose you could say like sort of conservative even kind of anti anti-marxist um academics in the 20th century and then it's, it's picked up by people who identify much more closely with the left so like famous American sociologist C. Wright Mills who wrote a book a very influential book The Parody and basically what he did was he took some of those more sort of conservative ideas and then try to adapt them to an analysis of, of who rules in America, basically. So the, the answer to the question is like, what is an elite is they are the people who exercise power in society. But I think also there's a question there as to, what, as to like, okay, well, what's the difference between, you know, the ruling class and the elite? And I think what, what a lot of scholars wanted to do who started using the term elite rather than ruling class, I mean, sometimes they were saying, look, we can have different types of societies, right? And in some cases, it, the people who are ruling will be the people who control like the economic sphere, but there are other types of people who exercise power in society who whose, whose power isn't necessarily based purely on like, on their relationships to say like the means of production as we, we would be like the focus of, a, of, of Marxist social theory. So, you know, we could think for example about, um, you know, a priestly caste in like um, pre-capitalist societies, or um, I mean, like you said, like we're going to need to talk a lot about the state, and then there's a sort of question of okay, well, where do the politicians fit in with the, the capitalist class? So, what C. Wright Mills did was he sort of say, okay, look, the thing is with the ruling class as a concept is it combines that idea of of ruling, which we think was being like a political thing, and then and then class, which is based on you know the control of the means of production, the organization of the economy and all the rest of it. It sort of combines the two. And I guess what he was trying to say was, all right, we can't just assume that the people who control the economy are also controlling the state. We need to we need to look at sort of descriptively as to who exercises power in society. And what he said was that okay we've got You've got the people who control big corporations, and and these are sort of synonymous with the cap, you know, the, the most powerful sections of the capitalist class. Then you've got the senior politicians, and he also said, look, you've got the, the guys in the Pentagon there, and this is at the height of the Cold War, who are running, you know, the the American imperialist infrastructure, you know, some of the most powerful, uh, the most powerful military in the world. And what he said was, look. At the core of these people, you've got this sort of overlapping group of personnel between like the military, the um, the corporate sector, and the, the the political elite in the state. So that that's kind of the background to this idea of using the term elites. Now, for me, like it's a question. I, I don't really mind like whether people use the term ruling class or or elite because I think once you get to capitalist society basically it does tend to be those people who are controlling the organization of the economy you know the capitalist class or the core of the capitalist class who comprise the dominant section of like the elite or the power structure or whatever and then we need to unpack these questions which has been a big preoccupation of like all kinds of left thinking through the 20th century up to today which is okay how does that ruling class rule right what is the relationship between these people who control the economy um, and these people who control the state. And I think what the concept of the elite allows us to do is have a vocabulary to talk about those people. Now, there's other things we need to add to that, but say one reason why I think that's useful is, say, it, it allows us to integrate state personnel, for example. So so, so that's, that's, I think, like, um, obviously we can go to like more depth as to what we mean by elite. I mean, it's, it's probably worth saying as well that 
the, the concept of like the, the power elite is a bit different to the elite. So the elite we can think of as just anybody who's kind of has a degree of power in society. And then there's like the, the people at the core of the elite. So that, and then there's lots of different terms that people use, but it doesn't really matter. But there's, there's, there's like people at the core of like, let's call it like the capitalist power structure. Now that's like the analytical question. And then the sort of, you know, empirical question is who are the British elite? And I think then the answer is essentially like the, uh, the people running the financial system, the people running the top corporations, and then you've got the super rich and the billionaires and the conservative party and the sort of, you can argue like members of the senior civil service. And they basically, um, the, the people at the core of the state apparatus, particularly like the Bank of England um, and, and, and the city, and those are the groups I mentioned. I would say those are the British power elite, right? And then they're at the core, and then we can sort of work our way out from there. To me, that's another way of thinking about like this, this sort of Gramscian question of, okay, how does the capitalist class rule in society? Well, it rules by exercising leadership amongst other groups of the, uh, you know, other, other classes, other, other class strata and other interests. So for me, it's just a flexible analytical tool that allows us to ask the question, okay, who, who, who dominates the society? Who dominates the power structures? And then once we get a sense of that, once we get a feel for that, then hopefully that allows us to act in, in, in ways which are more sort of, can be sort of informed by that. And that's obviously important because sort of on the left, axiomatically, we don't have the same sort of social power as these people. So we, you know, strategy is more important to us. These guys strategize as well, but you know, they don't have to strategize as much because they've got all, the, all of the resources and the social power. So it's, I think this is really important for, for us to understand. No, of course. No, thanks so much. Just to um, make sure we've talked about it so that you describe that as a kind of Gramscian question. Or, and just, so Antonio Gramsci, um, famously founder of the Italian Communist Party, the person who really gives us some of the key concepts of how we understand the workings of the dominant class through the 20th century and how the dominant class also has to make class alliances. Can you just say quickly what you think the key Gramscian question is? For, so that we've yeah, I, think, I think you summarised it really well, actually. I mean, a lot of people take it as the key Gramscian like, insight as being, OK, the dominant, the dominant class rules by consent as well as force. But, I mean, I think, you know, that's kind of obvious. I think actually what you said, said would, I would take to be exactly that, like the key insight, which is that you... So like you did this dominant elite, you know, that's a very, very small group and it can get smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, and when we analyze power, we could strip it down to like a few hundred people, a few thousand people and even a few million people um, who who have some sort of investment in the way that's strong investment in the way society is organized. And the closer you get towards the core, the more, you know, the more it's sort of central to their interests. So I think we can think of power as being not merely like because Obviously, like Marx, what, what Marx wanted to do was to think about different classes and the relationship between them. So you've got capitalists and workers, um, and the relation between them is that is one of exploitation. That's a way of expressing that sort of central dynamic in, in, in capitalist society. But then what, what, when we're thinking about the, the, the capitalist class as a whole, we have to think about the capitalist class as being divided, you know, and I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a little bit more detail, but also as, as having different levels of power. So what, what was Gramsci's insight? As, as you said, it was it was to, it was that the 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 ruling class, um, the capitalist class needs to work to build its support in society amongst other sort of subordinate groups. And it does that through a combination of force and coercion and you know let's be honest like deception which is often where where the where the media comes in no thanks so much now you've already touched on this but um so that we're having these films really to inform the practice and discussion in the sessions can you say a little bit more about this thing the state even kind of how you'd summarize the key aspects of it and you started to say about that the relationship between the elite and the state but i wondered if you could just summarize that again please Thank yeah you. i mean okay so what, what one big sort of you know gap in in classic marxist theory because marx never really sort of developed his sociology of the state that well so what a lot of um 20th century marxists were trying to do was sort of 
fill in all this gap, this gap and think about, okay, well, what role does the state play in these kinds of dynamics that, that, that Marx laid out? So a lot of the social, you know, the, the sort of high watermark, if you like, of like Marx's social theory of the 20th century was concerned with this sort of question. Um, and, and, and Gramsci really influenced a lot of those debates. Now, the, the classic one you'll read if you're into this sort of thing is this debate between um, Ralph Miliband and Nikos Polansis that took place in the late pages of the New Left Review. But I mean, I w I'm not recommending people read that because I think it's actually it's a bit of a waste of time, to be honest. Like, but it's, the reason it's important, actually, is that so Ralph Miliband was influenced by C. Wright Mills, who I mentioned earlier. So C. Wright Mills had a sort of left take on elite theory. Um, he, he had a strong influence on Ralph Miliband. And what Ralph Miliband basically started by asking, Ralph Miliband was a uh, Marxist sociologist, how is it, why is it, that the state serves the interests of capital? That's this kind of puzzle. And Palantis, Nicholas Palantis, who was a, a, a Greek Marxist theorist, who's very influential in the same period, we're talking like particularly the 1970s here, um, had this, asked the same sort of question. They had this big debate, um, and basically uh, the, the sort of Miliband middle, half of the debate was based on the idea that the state is the reason why the state serves the interests of capitalists. There's a sort of overlap in interests and personnel between the state and um, the people who run the corporation. So they, they went to the same sort of schools. Um, they, they come from the same sort of families. They had they live in the same kinds of neighborhoods, and they, they had this sort of set, shared interest based on their background and their interaction. So he sees the decision makers in the state, and this includes like. Uh, MPs, but also senior civil servants, as being part of the same sort of shared social background as the guys who are running the big corporations. So it's that it's that notion of an elite being not just people at the top of society, but people who who share interests, who, who sort of circulate. So there was this guy um, whose name I now forget. I think James Measel, not very interesting guy, like American political scientist. But he he, kept, he had this phrase um, something like consciousness, coherence, and conspiracy to describe. When does it, when we call something genuine and an elite? What he meant by that was that okay, we can have people at the top of the military, the top of you know this the state, the top of um, the big corporations, but do they actually share a set of interests? Now, what Miliband was trying to argue was that yes, they they, they do, and this is how this is formed, and he has this very sort of detailed account of, of, of how people in the state and the big companies see their interests. Anyway, Palanza says no, this is you're barking at the wrong tree here. The reason why the state does what it does is that it need well there's a whole set of reasons but basically he, he sees them as not being based on personnel but on stru the structure of the economy so the, the state for example needs to raise revenue and it needs to ensure profitability for the success of um politicians basically and there's a sort of dovetailing of interest but the thing is like so you've got the sort of structural side and you've got the sort of um individual side and i suppose like the individual side is more like what we'd call elites but i think that you they, they both move to each other's positions and really they're not, they don't contradict each other at all. So there's lots of reasons why the state might, or did particular sort of state institutions might reflect the interests of capital for sort of structural reasons. So there's um, there's a question of raising revenue through taxation. There's a the fact that the, the big businesses can do what's sometimes called investment strikes. So if they just don't invest in any productivity, that won't raise GDP. It'd be much more difficult for the government to raise the conditions of workers and then they will lose political um, consent and so on. There's also this question of, of, of lobbying as well. So um, business interests trying to influence the state by controlling like the informational environment, by presenting particular arguments that influence the way politicians understand political decision making and understand regulation. So there's all this stuff going on. Um, now I think what what the, what the state, what what sort of elite theory or state theory in, in, in sort of combined with each other allows us to do is to ask these kinds of questions um, in a way that which you which you can't if you just simply look at look at class interests. And like, to me, this is about thinking about power in a very sort of concrete way. So rather than just sort of asserting that, okay, certain class interests dominate in society, which I think we probably all accept and know, well, how does that, how does that process take place? Um, and I think Palantis, who I mentioned earlier, has this, this useful way of thinking about the state, which is to think about the state being formed in particular moments and with particular kinds of capacity. So if you think about something like the Bank of England, for example, 
you know, that comes from the crown, um, the British crown to fund itself during a period of war. Um, and what it ends up doing is regulating the um, money markets, which are arranged around these massive banks. And it has a particular regulatory remit. It has particular tools that it uses to manage um, economic, you manage the economy, basically, like, say, quantitative easing. What did quantitative easing do? They poured loads and loads of money into the, um, into the economy, and it went to the most affluent people in society because they're the asset holders. So that's an example of the way in which, like, that wasn't necessarily because the people at the Bank of England um, share a background to the people who are enriched by quantitative easing, although they do, and I'm sure that shapes their, their sort of decision-making as well. But the point is, like, the actual structures of the state, the resources that happen, like the levers, if you like, that they're able to pull if you're running a state, um, is sort of um, created by particular historical circumstances. So then some people like to think about, like, the capitalist state. So the idea that, like, the state isn't this sort of neutral site, you know, it's been formed in a particular context. So I feel like I've drifted off. What uh, am I <laughs> in front of the original question? No, that's no, that's all. No, that's all good. And there's, there's kind of a bigger answer than I th thought you're going to give. I was partly just. I mean, I think we talk about the state a lot, but. Um, OK, so, yeah, when we talk about sure sorry, anymore. I'm... Because that moment when people spent all their time banging on, as you say, I remember that moment, just the generation above me, when people just would you know, get into fisticuffs in the pub about Miliband of Palancis, that moment, yeah. because it kind of passed, our shared language about what the state is yeah. a little bit depleted. And I wondered just like, you know, if okay. you know, for, for people trying to organise resistance now, just like what would be, you know, what are the key things we need to know about what the state is and where it is? Yeah. Okay. I mean, sorry. Yeah, that's a but that's a more direct question, isn't it? But I don't think I don't think, I don't think it's any easier, really. I mean, the thing is, we use this term of state to to refer to like a whole set of different institutions with different kinds of backgrounds and origins. So actually, maybe my last slightly long-winded answer isn't as yeah much of a of a tangent as, a, as I was thinking because you know, like say for example, Department of Work and Pensions. Right, that's become a very repressive sort of institution that essentially just punishes people who aren't able to find work and in and really does make people's life a complete misery but there was a time in which you know the state institutions in the post-war era um would have parts of the welfare state had a much more sort of less um punitive and violent sort of element to them right so like the nhs would be you know probably one of the smallest parts that's left now of that kind of part of the state which i think re reflects more like the interests of the public like broadly rather than like an, than an economic elite so i think you know when we talk about the state I, I i'm not sure how useful an abstraction is it's probably better to think more concretely about the particular parts of the state you know so like obviously there's there's the army you know, and there's the NHS and there's the BBC, arguably, um, and they all perform very different social functions and they're all made up by different people and they have different relationships with, like, the core of the state. Like, so in other words, like, you know, like the cabinet and the prime minister and the senior civil servants and, like, the people who run COBRA or whatever. And obviously there's, like, as well as the army, there's, like, the secret states, so, like, MI5 and MI6. And, like, so different parts of the state, I think, like, have very different sort of um character to them and maybe like what we've been discussing is a useful way of actually developing that kind of i mean i hate the term nuance but like more sort of rich understanding of what these institutions are and like how we we navigate them rather than thinking a sort of blanket way of you know this is the state this is bad which again in most cases is is true <laughs> i mean most of the state is very bad um but then you know there are lots and lots of different state organizations i guess is what i'm saying yeah, no, and, and maybe what I partly hear from that, which might be helpful in the programme for us to think more about is not that the state is good or bad, but it's a kind of set of machineries of power. And instead mm. of thinking of it as one machine, one big robot, it's more like lots of mini robots or a kind of island yeah. system that has connections between it, but they all yeah, yeah, exactly. have a kind of logic perhaps. Yeah, so like, but, and also like going back to this question of like, you know, something at the core and at like kind of the edges, you know, like, so at the core of the state, you know, now we've got like the people who, and the Conservative Party and like the people at the top of MI5 and all of the rest of there. Yeah. And, and then I guess you've got other, you know, you've got stuff at the edge of the state, um, which, you know, will have a much more degree of, of political autonomy and maybe doing some good stuff like, like, 
locally you know like so if like local government isn't always bad right but it is technically as part of the state you know and it's quite a subordinate part of the state and the bbc isn't not everything the bbc does is bad and you know people can argue about whether the bbc is part of the state but like you know what i mean so i yeah i think you're right i think we can think about it as a big machine with like certain things at the core and then lots of things around around the edges and they're all doing very different things but they're all part of the, in one way or another of this sort of of this like power structure and that might help us go on to this next question that um i think you already know that one of the key themes through the program is how do we think about corporate power um how does corporate power relate to other forms of power in our society and how does it um relate to the state um, i was talking to a friend earlier and talking about in a slightly earlier moment perhaps in my biography and political lifetime there's a great deal of concern across the left that capital could capture the state that the state has a had a kind of autonomy the kind of democratic institutions that had their own resilience but increasingly um corporate control extended including extended transnational kind of captured this thing that we used to be able to turn to democratic ends but now we can't yeah i said to my friend i wasn't so sure that that way of thinking could stand anymore but i but now i wonder if it could stand for some bits of the state and not others but i wondered if you had any thoughts about how should we be beginning to think about the question of corporate power in relation to state power now i mean i think i broadly agree with like the the first description you gave it it's not like it's not like the state was um that there was a great period of the state and then like and then we lost grip of it but then i think at the same time it's very clear that like the state has become much more sort of it's been transformed by neoliberalism and has been been much more a creature of um corporate interests than than it was in that earlier period so again it's this question of like you know degree what 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 parts of the state were more democratized and and performed much more of a sort of um uh you know a, a public kind of function and how has that changed over time but i think you know it's worth bearing in mind how small that period of like social democracy or whatever you want to call it was from like 1945 basically to what like 1975 um or we could say like 1985 when it's yeah you know that's a very short period if you look at like i mean bear in mind that you know the british state hasn't even been fully democratized until like the 1930s so it's like and that's that's even that's not even the british state being democratized that's like a tiny bit of the british state so when we think of the bit of like that is legislature so i.e parliament and not even all of that because we've got, still got the house of lords you know um so we can think about i guess the, maybe it's something that i should have said earlier when you asked about the state it's like okay what 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 basically what is it and then like it's, it's that whole sort of apparatus um which isn't part of the private sector you know and it is an abstraction but then there's, there's the government and there's the executive and then there's the legislature and that's the tiny bit that we managed to democratize with the asset with you know the growth of universal suffrage and the, the democratic power that we had but most of the state compl remained completely undemocratic was run in the same sort of ways and by the same sorts of people even during that period it's just these massive concessions were made by the British establishment and and the structure of the state did change so like you know it had different ministries like the Ministry of Housing or whatever which was which was doing very very different things but that was that little period you know where the labor movement in this country and in other countries was able to get a real foothold um one in the executive and to go through this very small period of change um that was rolled back, but then the, the the state was completely undemocratic before that. So I guess we've got this like process of like, you know, and, and what were the limits to that? I mean, most of the debates on the left in the 1970s were around like, you know, onwards were around how do we democratize society and the state more broadly, like rather than this small bit, which was very, very limited around parliament in its very sort of elitist, um, top down form of democracy, you know, and some of that got reawakened under Corbynism and then like quickly crush so okay sorry i'm going on a bit the uh the live near liberal period i mean i think there's a lot going on there but so number but a few things to note about the role of corporate power i mean the state obviously becoming privatized sections of the state leaving the state and going into the private sector but also 
this process of sort of outsourcing and the whole shift in sort of regulatory structure, which meant that you know the corporations ended up delivering a lot of state functions instead of that being publicly owned and under sort of notional democratic control. You know, however that worked in practice, um, you had this sort of the state sort of becomes this kind of network of private interest, basically. So you get like these big companies like G4S, you know, which are delivering all kinds of services which were previously run by the state and loads of companies which make loads of money from lobbying for contracts for, from the government and then winning them for the government. And so we saw this during COVID, you know, all of these crises, well, they, didn't, they weren't crises and nothing happened, but all of these exposes, exposes of um, you know, very common political corruption around um, around uh, corporate influence over the state. And we just see that again and again and again. So I think, you know, with, with neoliberalism, you've got this sort of breakdown of like a public ethos and the idea that politicians and civil servants should be doing things to, oh, that's a problem. So really what we need to do is we need to get the private sector to deliver that. Deliver that. And not only was this a terrible idea in terms of like sort of you know, basic principles of justice. I mean, it was also just terrible in terms of running stuff. You know, it was because it was all based on this like, notion, of course, the private sector can do everything well, but we know they can't. Like, because you see what happened during during COVID, like you had this like collapse in state capacity. But so I think, I think the state has been more instrumentalized by corporate power. And you can see it in these sort of lobbying scandals and these, um, you know, contract contracting out of, of state functions. But I, I don't, I guess we need to sort of resist that idea that that's some that there was this great state before then and now we've lost it. I don't know. Was was that what you were meaning in terms of like not, not hanging on to that idea of the state? Well, I guess maybe I'll come out a bit more on the other things I want, want to ask you. So I guess my my query and some of the other conversations I'm going to have will be a little bit about the idea that there is a discrete machinery called the state open to capture by actors that we call corporations doesn't seem to me to quite reflect either structures of governance or the, the, the shape and movement of corporations in this moment, even though it might have more accurately described those two entities even 40 years ago. Do you mean so, in the sense that they're more merged with each other? Or? They're more merged with each other. I think states have changed very much. I think that... I. I absolutely recognize some of the key institutions of the state that you describe but i also think um as, as you already have said that the functioning of state institutions has changed and that change has also been a dismantling and remaking of, of states especially you know, <coughs> briefly social democratic states where the key institutions may have been structured as either distributive or coercive or a combination and there's been a shift towards everything being coercive which you talked mm. about but that shift it's not just a change in flavor it's a change in actually what what the institution is who is in it what its machinery is mm. and it changes what it would mean to capture it yeah and also corporations have clearly transformed you now we'll talk about this more in the course that what, when we think about the corporation the corporation is a a diff it's all it was already a set of beasts and now it's a very different set of beasts now, there's, what what does it mean to think about facebook capturing the state it doesn't it doesn't really compute as a question i is the thing i would want to suggest but that is yeah no i agree with that actually open, really yeah but yeah please do come back yeah no no I, I agree with that i mean i think to be honest like that's that's one of those problems when we talk about the state is like it, it is it's such an abstract term but i think generally what people have think tend to think that okay there's there is an object called the state which obviously there isn't right it, it, it's, it's 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 such a sort of it's such a sort of crude ab abstraction where you can think that there's an object out there called the state but really what there is is a, is a set of um complicated political political socio-political relationships and networks through these different sorts of institutions and you know we can I mean, it's even hard to picture the state. That's why when you ask me what the state is, I'm like, oh God, no. Because when when, when I try to do like lectures and I was like, oh, I'll do my bit about what the state is. And then you realize you just go down a rabbit hole, like the more you think about it, because it's one of these sort of common sense concepts, which I think when you start to unpick it, it just sort of collapses. But I think probably like 
uh, Bob Jessup, who kind of follows Palantis uh, along the same lines about the state, thinking about the state as a sort of dynamic institution that reflects and changes as, 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 as social struggles change in society, it might be useful there. Because he thinks about the state as not an object, but like a set of relations in society. And that might be a better way of us thinking about it. I mean, you know, that said, I think there are there are state institutions and there are people in sitting in buildings, you know, of the DWP and, you know, they're, they're and, and MI5 and MI6 and, and all of the rest of it. But to be honest, like, there's not been a huge amount of, like, um, you know, work, work on the state, which is, I guess, being able to sort of catch up with what you're saying or leave at least not, not, that, I, not that I've read. So um, I think there's lots of stuff out there we can maybe sort of pull on and, um, and develop. But I think, yeah, I think you're right about that. And, and so then that leads on to... Um really and, and maybe we might end with this discussion which is you know the, the point of this program is to use different insights some from scholarship some from political practice some from different movements to think about what our collective analysis of of really class power in our society is of course <coughs> in order to overthrow it that you know that has to be the game hasn't it so given that what the conversation we've had about um how how hard you know the, the, the idea of the state it's like a marshmallow and you try and push it and it kind of bags out another way and we can't quite pin it down can you say a little bit about the kinds of techniques of power of analyzing power that might be useful to transfer to those different locations because that's something that we'll be wanting to pick up in the program thanks yeah you you, you mean sort of ways which we might make sense of these sets of institutions basically yeah i mean i think th 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 there's lots of ways that you can do this but i mean i think it is trying to like put flesh on the bones of the, the sort of abstract concepts that we have you, you know so you can see like as we get the question like what well, why is the state like, okay well let's let's figure out what these different institutions and relationships are and try and sort of map that in some way. And I think like most people who work in these kinds of traditions have basically tried to do that. They try to move beyond an abstract sort of theoretical concept of how power operates in society and think, oh, okay, well, let's sort of get under the, you know, under the bonnet of this thing, you know, these kind, these sets of institutions or the sort of machinery, as we put it, and try and figure out how does it work, right? What what's the nature of these of these of these structures, and can we actually get our hands dirty a little bit trying to figure that out? And there's there's lots of different ways that people have tried to do that. I mean, it's it's a bit like what um, used to get called like a class composition analysis, but that, which people used to do on the left and still still doing. I think it's coming getting more popular again, which is really good. Which is sort of thinking about you know what does class mean for our side um you know what 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 does the, the kinds of relations and experiences and identities that we have now tell us about the nature of capitalism and our place in it and then it's like doing the same for them basically you know so like we think about okay that that's th this is our class um what about their side like uh, and 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 what what's what's the relate set of relationships and cultures that they have how do their networks and institutions function and i think we can think about that in terms of like at the level of elites, like the people who populate these kinds of institutions or networks. And then we can think about it about in terms of like the sort of machinery itself, which I think will include the, include the institutions. I mean, the way that I think about this is like, you know, we've got individuals and networks of individuals like collectives, and then we've got their culture. And then we've also got the organizations that they operate in. And then it's about, okay, well, how do we make sense of all those, all of those things? Like how can we sort of empirically figure out you know how they operate and i think that, so uh Domhoff, who was this, this uh american sociologist still around like and he, he basically followed on from the the work of cy mills who i mentioned earlier he pioneered what he calls power structure research and a lot of people on the left in the united states have, have used this in trying to make sense of say like map particularly communities like at a local level so say if you want to get something done and you you, uh, you know it could be any kind of local struggle around like uh, gentrification or planning decisions or outsourcing or something like that then try and figure out you know who are the people who are the key decision makers who's running this place right so you could do that at sort of the community level and actually a lot of elites research did that they started with looking at like towns and cities and trying to figure out you know who are the elites here but we could do that 
a different level as well. Like, so those go to the sort of core of the institutions of politics and the economy and just think, try and figure out who, who are these guys? And so how would we do that? Well, you can use, the thing is with like the British elite in particular, there's actually like loads and loads of information on them. So it's, it's much more difficult to research elites in many other players, societies because there's lower levels of transparency. I mean, in Britain, like the level of corruption is just completely in your face. And this is what I find funny about like all these journalists suddenly saying, oh my God, you know, did you, you know, all of this stuff is being exposed. And, it, you know, it's been in plain sight the whole time. Like the, the, the MPs literally have lists of the big companies that they're working for. They've, they've had them there for like two decades. They list the people who, who fund their campaigns, right? So if you want to know, who's bankrolling particular MPs, there, there's there's a list that, of, of people who are providing those money. If you want to know who those companies are, you can go to Companies House, and there's loads of information there on who the directors are of those particular companies, so there's the decision makers. Um, who owns those companies? So it will tell you if somebody's got a share of, share of control of those companies. Is it, I mean, before I was an academic, I used to do this stuff in sort of somewhere between like journalism and like business intelligence and there are these guys who do these kinds of things like it's in the corporate sector on like due diligence so some guy comes in and wants to invest in a company you know are, are they dodgy are they involved in crime and they pay lots of money so people dig up dirt on them you know we can do similar sorts of things on the left so one of the things you can do is you know if you look at press reports say read the stuff that they write about for each other like if you want to know about the conservative party then read the spectator you know that's like that house journal i mean some of it is just like you know, crazy racist crap, but some of it is them seriously trying to, in their own way, seriously, trying to figure out, you know, what their political interests are, but also describing all the gossip around, like, who who's friends with who, you know, what are their policy positions. Um, so you can, so other things, like things like think tanks, right? So the, the, the think tanks are the places where a lot of these policies get made. They're sort of like hubs for the political elite, they get funded by the big corporations and often they get funded by these sort of private family foundations uh, and they're often they're the same sorts of people who fund the conservative party so there's there's, there's lots of data there particularly on um where money goes right so you can find that at the electoral commission you can find that at uh, parliament's website you can find that to a degree at the charities commission as well um there's lots of information on what they say to each other you know if you can have access to something like Nexus UK or like some uh, some uh, newspaper database, you can usually get the access to these through your local libraries. It's very easy to like build up a picture of who these people are. And often if people are powerful, then they're being written about by journalists, um, usually in like terrible sort of fawning terms, describing their sort of rise from rags to riches and, and all of the rest of it. But that will give you a pretty good sense of like, or a good enough sense of, of who you know, the elites are and, and what their networks are. So you can do that sort of descriptively and like sort of feel your way around, or you can do it in a more sort of um, rigorous way using like techniques like say social network analysis, where you could build up a picture of people's specific links to each other and find out, you know, who are the most central people in particular networks, who are, you know, are there particular cliques, um, are there particular um backgrounds that people have you know uh, and the personal relationships and you'll find like often as well and i'm going to talk about in the media a little bit you know the, the, them even on wikipedia like you just google a journalist you see on like the bbc or like the times or wherever and often their partner is like a conservative politician or whatever so there are those you know there's those romantic and familial relationships that also bind together you know the sections of the elite and most of that's public knowledge basically so i guess yeah, that, that's what I would call power structure research. But you could, you know, you can call it whatever you want, really. It's, it's a way of trying to um, investigate and expose, like, networks of, of, of power, like, in their actuality, I guess. No, thank you so much. And, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do in the next session when we're face to face. And I think you might be joining us. So that would be wonderful. So, OK, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, no worries.